it gets people to, to read more, I think, because they want to write more, they want to understand things more. So uh, Jacks by Jacks facilitates that and creates an environment where anybody with a little bit of interest can get involved and exchange ideas and, and writings and, and uh, but that's why I, uh, I like to contribute as I can to that uh, scenario and I don't mind writing a check every so often, you know, to, to help out. jump off but it's a long way down and everyone knows we old monuments to the south can't just take ourselves down. You know it was a beautiful morning when he put me on this pedestal but it's starting to get a little muggy. In fact it's downright hot and frankly wearing this thing is uncomfortable. It's a violation of my rights and I'm not taking it anymore. Oh, did you think I meant my mask in a pandemic? Don't be ridiculous. Welcome to part two of Jacks by Jacks 7. Official history may be written after the fact by the winners of wars, but real history is chronicled in real time in the soul songs of artists and writers. It's these upwellings that social scientists mine to find the unalloyed truth of a moment. Writers of Jacksonville, this is our moment and we are writing its history. There's a lot to unpack in 2020. Pandemic, isolation, fear, poverty, climate change, social injustice, and political division. There's also the hope for a better, brighter tomorrow, found in the work of a new generation of activists who are inspiring us with their courage and their willingness to get into good trouble for a righteous cause. This is a story of our times, and it's playing out right here in this beautiful, broken, ugly, healing, southern gothic mess of a city we call home. The Jacks by Jacks Literary Arts Festival was created for this moment. And even though we can't get together in person due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there are things that need to be said and voices that must be heard, especially now. We welcome you virtually this year as we hear from writers, young and old, in all colors, shapes, and sizes, with words that open your mind, lift your spirits, and heal your heart. We are Jacks by Jacks, Jacksonville Writers, Writing Jacksonville. The uh, coronavirus got a hold of me pretty strongly. I now know that I contracted uh, COVID-19 uh, sometime between March 1st and March 8th of 2020. Uh, it was uh, at a church where I serve as um, Minister of Music, Director of Choirs, uh, and that's at Hendricks Avenue Baptist Church. Uh, this was in a time period when we didn't know that the virus was already here in Jacksonville and uh, some of us um, in the choir were, were getting sick. Uh, my first symptoms didn't pop up till around March 15. Um, in that time period we had about seven people test positive for COVID-19 by, by mid-March. Um, we didn't find out till later in June when the antibody test was available. Uh, that we really had an outbreak of about 22 people who contracted it. By March 25th, Wednesday, March 25th, uh, my symptoms had uh, uh, 
worsened quite a bit, had gone downhill. Um, the scariest symptom was the shortness of breath, um, where walking from my bed to the, ki the, the bathroom sink um, took me, um, it took me forever <laughs> to walk. I could not walk very quickly, and I probably breathed about 40 breaths in one minute um, and would just have to stand there to catch my breath, to think through calming my lungs down. Um, it was a force of nature that was in my lungs that I couldn't control um, that was taking my breath away. So I, I um, around 9 o'clock the night of March 25th, I drove myself um, down to um, Baptist South. All I wanted was some oxygen. I knew I needed oxygen. I knew I needed fluids and I needed to rest um, and maybe some medicine. <laughs> I don't know what, but I needed something. Um, so my hope was to go to the ER, check in to the hospital perhaps for a couple days and go home. When I arrived at the ER, um, they took me back through a series of hallways and uh, into uh, some prepared spaces for COVID patients. I was the only one at that time. Um, it looked like a sci-fi movie um, with people in, um, you know, PPE and hazmat suits and, um, and, and air filters and, and big plastic sheets with um, duct tape, it seemed, uh, and just a sterile environment. So I was in the resuscitation room. They finally tested me for COVID-19. Um, they interviewed me. And at that point, that's when they told me I was in grave condition, um, that I might be on the ventilator by about seven or eight in the morning. Um, this was around four in the morning on March 26. So I spent several hours in the ER um, before they ever took me to ICU. Um, the, the doctors and the nurse, nurses in the ER were very frank with me um, that I might be on the ventilator, I might not ever come off the ventilator. The doctor encouraged me to um, call my wife uh, to try to get my wife and my kids to the ER. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't make the phone call. Um, I froze. Um, I was shocked. Uh, I, I couldn't fathom what was going on. Uh, it was the first time that I had faced death, um, or a kind of death sentence, perhaps. Um, and it was very scary. Um, the doctor came back and asked me if I had called my wife. I said, nope. <laughs> she said, do, do you want me to call her? I said, yes, please. So she made several attempts. Um, I finally tried to call. I kind of woke up out of the shock. We couldn't get in touch with her. It was so early in the morning hours. I knew she kept her phone off, uh, or at least on silent. So um, that hit me. Uh, it hit me to make some video that I that that my family and friends uh, and colleagues um, might not hear from me. Um, they might not hear from me for days or weeks um, or ever. And um, so I I took my phone out and started making uh, about minute to two minute long videos, and then just sending them off text. You know, texting them to. Uh, my wife and children, to uh, my parents, uh, to my brothers, and then to friends and colleagues. Um, and uh, then my phone ran out of power. <laughs> They're uh, about to put me on a ventilator for about an hour, for about a week or two, to try to help my body and my lungs overcome the, uh, the disease. 
So, uh, just wanted y'all to know, uh, y'all are great friends. Even texting far apart. Have fond memories of all three of you. And, uh, proud of all of you and all that you've done. So, uh, just sending these out the best I can, best I know. Uh, I just found out about two hours ago this is where we were headed. So, tell everyone in your family's hello for me. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a way to follow through Facebook. Just take care of Rachel and the kids. That's my biggest concern. Uh, I hate this, y'all. Okay. More videos to make. Love you three. When I got up to ICU, uh, there was just this team of nurses and doctors that greeted me, and it was, uh, it had to be about 15 to 20 of them. Um, it was like they were waiting for me, and uh, they probably were. <laughs> um, and at that point, I relaxed. I, I, don't, I don't know um, if they had given me some really good medicine, um, if, if um, I just felt like I was in the right place and these people were going to take care of me and I trusted them. I remember there were times at home where I felt abandoned. You know, I just, what do I do? I'm alone. I, I have this, um, everybody's asleep in the house. I can't sleep. And my, my chest was just in some kind of shape that I'd never experienced before and coughing or not being able to breathe. And I remember crying out like as a whisper, you know, God save me. And um, just, I, that, I just uttered that without even thinking it because it was just, just a, a time that I'd never want to relive. <laughs> in the ER, in those moments where I was alone, where I was faced with death, um, I went to um, the Psalms, um, walking through the valley of death, knowing um, that, that God was still with me, um, walking alongside me, and, and knowing that the miracle of modern medicine was my friend, <laughs> and uh, those nurses and doctors were to me the arms of God. Two viruses. Virulent storms create chaos in us, dis-ease breaking the heart, disorienting the mind, numbing the soul, angering the body. Two viruses at times dormant, activated cells cloaked and waiting, in flame an already compromised system. Both 19s, one 10 months young, requires distancing and masking. Another, a 4,815 months old infection, needs eliminating for good, a hate-filled contagion spreading from generation to generation to generation to generation. Both kill unjustly 200,000 breathless souls, isolated, alone, dismissed as old and frail. Countless others murdered Victims of hate, saints of glory, lynched, dragged, shot, choked, 
no more alive because of the color of their skin. Both surround us, asymptomatically apathetic, ignored for too long, tensions building, now erupting, vaccine needed, voices rising, virulent storms in us. I'm addicted to two things, coffee and buying books. <laughs> we try to keep all the books that we can on our shelf. So it's, it's, it's uh, I think the bookstore kind of, it provides a, a uh, just a large variety of anything you can think of as far as uh, titles that people can come in and, and uh, find and discover. Variety of titles is, is very important. So what allows that is one simple thing, it's square footage. It's how much space do you have. The, the smaller bookstores, they have to limit their categories and their titles and, and that's it. I, I've, never, I've always thought, keep expanding. Instead of having four feet of philosophy, you know, that wide, you'd have uh, 40 feet or 50 feet. Why not? Somebody comes with a list. I can usually find nine out of ten titles if I walk around with them and say, "This is here it is." Nine out of ten—that's pretty darn good. That allows Chamblins to be unique by having a large assortment of titles available. Literature, like we take a certain Nietzsche or whoever, Hemingway—we have all their titles. See, and when you have all of them, you know, somebody wants a Hemingway, they come in for one title of Hemingway. Well, hell, we've got you know, 25 titles, you know, that kind of thing. We closed down basically inside for about two months in the early part of the year. And we people would pick up books on the sidewalk and we would deliver. I would deliver some on my motorcycle and just deliver books. But, uh, so when we opened up, uh, for some reason our sales actually exceeded by 10, 15 percent what the pre-COVID average was. Our thing is, 2020 is going to be, I mean, we'll, we'll never forget this, this, this COVID thing. And of course, we won't forget Trump either. <laughs>
in our world as we know it, uh, unfortunately. The voices of women and other oppressed groups are not heard as much as they should be. Right now what we're working on is our annual anthology. We're producing volume two, which is a collection of over 85 women artists and writers from our community um, documented in a very high-end publication that we call A River Rising, Anthology of Women's Voices. And uh, this particular edition is called our Birds and Blooms edition, and it reflects the past semester of writing and art, which was the birds exhibit in the fall and the blooms exhibit in the spring. And of course what we didn't anticipate when we put together the themes for our two semesters was what would really be blooming in 2020, which was uh, the coronavirus and of course the protest movement that grew up after the death of George Floyd. So we have the blooming of the protest movement and, the, and Black Lives Matter. And it's really caused us to take a good hard look at our work and how radically inclusive we are and how we can do better. We want to not just be an inclusive organization, of course, but we want to be an anti-racist organization, just as every one of us should be. I've always struggled with that, normally. Like, you know, what right do I have to be writing when other people suffer so much? Friends of mine from childhood, for example. Um, and I think more than ever, you know, you, you have to say, yeah, yeah, that's happening, but to stop creating is kind of considered defeat. You have to keep doing it, keep going. There's a place for it, there's a respite that is necessary. Um, there's hope that we can give. Um, uh, certainly, um, there's a, when things are hard, I think that's when you, people need the arts the most. And that, whether they be superhero movies or poetry, they, that's what we turn to, um, to kind of console ourselves and get through. Quinceañera, sister from a common womb, another country, that isn't anymore. We didn't know we rose in Africa or to what occasion. Thought we, understand, thought we understood the world. Cuban browns on a Hialeah fence. Mijos, mommy said, come sass me when I am 15 years buried. New Year's Day. December shuts its door on night's high wall, eye clear sky this morning, gusts rattling cages of brambles now, a field's yield of warblers dropped frozen from the clouds. Our town goes on with its drizzle and leashed dogs. We pass ghosts lean as winter weeds or cattle wire. They know what they are and keep their distance like fog. Again, we turn our faces to lessen the wind's sting. Again, we hope to be neither prey nor hunger, the children in them, nor the chain link kennels. And a great part of me will escape the grave. Yellow as a late October sun, there was a dust in these hills once, and other peoples long departed. Might as well honor the bumblebees, felling so loud. Might as well mourn grass. What was carved has given up its hold, blank as quicksilver, these hickory flats gravestones, slate weather smoothed by scarcity and years. All had a name, a first day, a last one as themselves, no more. Still, someone has brought flowers, paper white and red, plastic, two per grave. Using the scout's handbook while learning English. Not yet a full animal, no longer fully a cub, 
sunlight green on me through summer's high canopy, a stream mud-cheeked from last night's rains. From 15 years later, I see myself, lean for my age, light-boned as a kestrel, fleeing a housing project not so much life preserver as a hurricane's next island. But today, the tallest I've been and growing, I think I've come for animals. From their world, mine must seem both comically unstealthy and full of sudden excitement. But I see, as I still see, both the signs on the mud and the need to read them. Their tracks a test for the handbook. And it answers. A pair of raccoons, deer, and later what I wanted to be a bear but was just a dog. The known names beside the unknown. Muskrat, grouse, skunk. And I don't yet know why I'll remember this day when I asked and was answered, when the world spoke its persistent language and I, with due care, understood. Swan Song. I, in time, am sick of living with myself anytime soon as alibi. Rose of Jericho's odd duckling bloom Call a thorn on the lungs playing its long game. And you, a miner's daughter in hate with her last decade, hands up like a policeman's bullet's corpse, dark with no chance of humor. What is left for transformation? This beach we walk, its few bittersweet clams and baby's ears, terse diamonds on the literal's midden, Tomorrow, this same time of day will pass you by in another continent. But for now, you toe dig at a stone crab's shell, molted or dead. Some have looked on their children like this, or nieces or brothers. The Atlantic breathes less each year, and the tides rustle fewer coquinas. But the answer is molted. And this is the last poem, um, yay, uh, in the dark times. I fix a coat from air to clothe my fears, except tomorrow will be full of cracks and their attendant gusts. The roof over my life may be past repair. I wait for words sent out like crows to return, even if soaked, wings like broken branches. Buy a stranger a burger. Hand another paper money. No, they'll both stomach hunger anew. I drop each of my hours like a crumb. I won't walk this way again. My days line up like inmates and clap hands. They clap hands for me and I sing. I think we're having a lot of a lot of things, whether it's racial disparity and inequity with people, or whether it's an environmental um, crises. Everything's coming to the forefront at the same time. And I've lived here most of my life. I'm 52, so it's kind of the reckoning. I go back the way I came in. I go back in silence. I go back believing I'm still needed by my recovering husband, by my young daughter, believing it is still my job to save the world. I am a mother after all, in that womb room, the space of potential arising in me is vast. I am terrified of the advice to detach with love. Because in my big, fat, personal dictionary, it equates to abandonment. I remember the words of the ranger on our morning walk at Mesa Verde in Colorado a few weeks before. 
Are you using your breath the way it was intended when it was given to you? Are you honoring all of life, all of life forms with your life? Arriving home was unceremonious. The first day we floated around admiring our kitchen with its black and white tiled floor, our kitchen larger than the whole camper. My husband was as healed as he was going to be and he felt rejuvenated. My daughter was happy to see her friends. Exhausted, I headed to the studio and I dug out the drawing and hung it back up on the wall. It felt good to be alone. I looked at it for weeks while renovating my studio. Then one day I decided to dye the whole thing red. That is all I could think of doing. So I did. It looked like menstrual blood, a deep dark cloud spreading against silver and gold. I put the fabric in and let it go. I worked on hand sewing the 16 foot tapestry drawing to a tie dyed backing, pushing the needle in and out for an hour, sometimes once a day, most times only once a week. An hour alone in my studio was my practice for the next few months. Alone in the studio, I pushed the needle in and pulled the red thread through. For those 60 minutes, I could focus, I could cry, I could breathe. Outside the studio, I was simultaneously doing deep inner work with my own map of a family tree, coming to terms with generations of alcoholism, adoption, and addiction. It's no wonder that when I set out to draw a tree of life, a giant brain appeared first, separating me from this ancient axis mundi. 18 inches, some say, is the longest journey from heart to head. Usually that distance is mentioned in the context of learning to forgive. The walls of separation are constructs of my intellect. My ego self is 100% invested in being unique. Independent, dominant, alone. How do we evolve empathy? Is it common ground? The Florida black bear is born blind and the size of a guinea pig and can't fend for itself as the hunters claim at nine months old. Is it that we understand we are in need of the same thing? that bears like the sweet life, just like us, and will seek out a honey tree for miles and remember it for years? Or do we learn to look at our differences as a sign of a healthy community of diversity, that an organic system thrives on discovery and variation, not homogeneous conglomeration? Yes, sometimes I rage like the bear on the roof of the house that Jack built because sometimes it is necessary to defend the rights of the small and voiceless. Sometimes I rage because I feel trapped in my own thin skin and I feel vulnerable in the dark, believing in my own fear that what will emerge is violence and not love if I let my shield down to other. But if I can hold my tender heart open, and see it for what it is, which is unfathomable possibility, redirect my energy to creative space making, where there is room for all of our needs to be met, then I can get down off that roof because I'm not trapped anymore. I think it's been tough at times to like to, to have the juice to sit down and write um especially like a lot of the political stuff and uh you know it's frustrating and frustration leads, leads to exhaustion 
And it's really tough not to just get in that loop of anger, frustration, exhaustion, um, especially when, you know, things have been so bad in a lot of ways. And so for me, a lot of that has been, you know, art has been good in that you have to kind of get a bigger perspective and um, like try and revitalize yourself to sit down and make the art. Despite having finished all my work and already using a new materials Tone gave me for the treehouse, for the first time I heard them play, I contemplated not going to see Donnie and the Crocs. I kept telling myself it wasn't because of Sarah and Donnie that I've gone every week for over a year and I just wanted to do something different. But when I tried to think of something else to do, I became horribly depressed. It seemed as if every other thing in the world, even lying in bed staring at the ceiling, would be incredibly tiring. I thought about visiting Mother W or Jones, but I had no idea what I would say to them or what we would do. For a moment, I even considered knocking on shadows, what I've come to call the man who lives below me, Door, but I couldn't stomach the idea. The tree house seemed too large and empty to be in alone. It took me 15 trips up and down the alley before I had enough courage to walk inside the bar. I tried to sneak in without Sarah seeing me, as if I could hide from her the whole night, but she was watching the door, waiting. When she saw me, she vigorously waved and called out to me. Donnie and the Crocs were playing a soft, romantic tune. A thin veil of smoke with a pinkish hue hung in the air. Blue roses the size of a thumbnail fell from Donnie's trumpet as he played. A couple, seeking seclusion in the booth in the back left corner, whispered and flirted with each other. The man put his arm around her and pulled her close, his head leaning back on the brick wall behind him. Smoke and time caused the bricks to become coppery in color. She rested her head on his shoulder, gazing up into his eyes. They gently swung back and forth in a drunken rhythm, mouths inches from each other, hinting at, but never realizing, a kiss. Maybe it's the weight we like the most. Maybe we prefer the promise of satisfaction to satisfaction itself. I was afraid you weren't going to show. It wouldn't be the same without you, Sarah said as I sat down at the bar. I didn't think you'd notice. I was baiting her. It felt sour. Who else am I going to tell my every secret to? I smiled then turned to watch Donnie and the Crocs play. Their white suits juxtaposed their shining dark skin. The bar smelled like honey and lavender, probably from the piano player. Or maybe it was Sarah putting on a new perfume for Donnie, who began his solo. Watching him play, I was overcome with a childlike admiration and vile jealousy. His song was emotional and intense. It was as if he tore open my chest to unearth and express all the pain, passion, and hopelessness I couldn't bear to look at myself. He became more and more fervent as he played until he broke out into a deaf dance around the stage. I was transfixed. Despite being a giant in height and stature, he floated through the air, returning to the ground only to give it a gentle kiss with his toes. His instruments and movements, transcended rhythm and sound, reached the highest level of expression. He touched divinity. They're really on tonight, Sarah said, leaning on the bar. I didn't want you to miss this. They never turn it off, I replied. The semicircle stage was lit from below by soft yellow lights. The sax and trumpet sparkled gold as Donnie and Domingo put them to their lips. It was Tao's turn for a solo now. Just as Sarah had described it, Tao's tied two drumsticks into his long hair. The hair played perfectly in rhythm alongside his arms. The most complex, penetrating, and moving sounds came from his drums. Luckily, this made it loud in the bar, so Sarah and I just watched in awe. I wasn't ready yet. I left the bar as Tao's solo came to an end, giving Sarah a quick goodbye. There outside was cold, and a dim sun, and a dim rising sun broke up the darkness of the night. When I reached my apartment, Shadow was standing outside, staring up at the roof as if he could see the treehouse through the invisibility barrier. This troubled me. He turned his head as I approached, but I barreled past him. I like it, he said softly as I walked by. I pretended not to hear. I, I spent a lot of time alone, like a lot of people, 
And I think the thing that started to grow and fester was the whole idea of my mortality. Like in any one moment I could walk out the door and be perfectly well and come back sick and then die. So that began, I began thinking about how that, you know, uh, spread out into whether or not I was going to finish my projects. You know, was I going to have unfinished projects? How, could I finish my projects? How, you know, could I go faster, et cetera, et cetera. So what ended up happening is that over time, you know, I began to realize that I could die any day. <laughs> it could have happened anytime, anywhere in my life. And that, yeah, I'm going to end my life with unfinished projects no matter what. Two Spoons of Bitter. Ella Donovan has worked very hard to be in control of her own life with a major move to a new city and a dream job as an art therapist working with teen addicts. Little does she know, a fateful phone call is about to drag her down a rabbit hole of unfinished business and family secrets. Ella? This you, Ella? Huh? Sorry, Ella mumbled into the phone. Her clock read 5.15 a.m. Been through hail and high water trying to reach you. Don't you return your messages? Annie Mary Jane? What's wrong? Thought she was coming for a visit. Yeah, but we're short on counselors. No excuses. Your grandma's getting worse. Ella? Ella, say something. Is she in pain? That a joke or something? Listen here, kiddo. The cancer won. Gotta let her go. Let her go? Gotta let her die. Let her die? Time to grow up, Ella. You need to come home now. You gotta both say your goodbyes. Now, no, I just got my job. I, I just moved into my own place. I'm still unpacking. No back talk. She's your blood. She's your grandmother. Time to forgive and forget. Me saying goodbye is not going to change the past or fix anything between us. She's family. Damn it, Ella. I'm happy now. I don't want to dredge all this up. Shame, shame, shame on you, Ella Donovan, with all your psychology learning and the work you do. Can't see the forest for the trees. It's a done deal. Talk to your boss, uh, Lou, what's her name? Anyway, stop over to her office before you leave. Your grandma's in Blackbird City, Four Seasons Hospice. Ella loaded her suitcase reluctantly into the car. The heavy scent of blooming magnolias hung thickly in the air. She sat for a minute at the end of her driveway, trying to hang on to the picture. It had just rained, and little rays of sunlight glistened through the canopy of old oaks that sheltered her quiet, Victorian-style neighborhood. A woman walked her dog along the cobblestone street. A variety of ducks bobbed on the wide, lazy river nearby. Across the river, edges of the city skyline were lightly embossed into the foggy broom. Tomorrow, she would be in Minnesota. If it hadn't already started snowing, the entire countryside would be a dull, flat monochrome of browns and grays. Two teaspoons of bitter for every teaspoon of sweet. Just like Mary Jane always said to her when she was growing up, like it was fate or a curse or something she carried in her blood. One minute life could be waxing along as sweet as the cherry limeades that Ty had left on her desk every day for weeks trying to win her attention. And the next, kiss the wrong guy or get a phone call at the crack of dawn, and it could all turn bitter. Like having to grow up with Grandma, her old crow whiskey and all her demons, and that mean little trailer on the other side of the railroad tracks. Like her mother and father dying in a car accident. Two teaspoons of bitter for every teaspoon of sweet. It's the way it is. Just accept it. She arrived at work, hurrying through the lobby to Miss Lou's office. She numbly responded to staff members offering condolences for her dying grandmother. If corporations could ever get in control of Southern word of mouth, they'd save millions in advertising. And good morning to you, Miss Donovan, Miss Lou said, furiously rubbing at the pink frosted nails with the cotton ball. Sorry, sorry, good morning, Miss Lou. Finally, learning some manners. Ella fought the urge to roll her eyes, a habit she'd gotten into from hanging around Joe. Lou set her task aside, studied Ella for a moment. Had a very interesting phone call last night. Yes, I know, I told you my grandmother was dead, but there are things I just didn't want to talk about. Want to talk about them now? Rather not. Very well, you have not been employed long enough to earn family leave time, but I requested it anyway. 
It was approved, signed this form. She handed Ella some papers. I'm not going, Lou. I can't just leave my clients. Lou leaned back in her chair and narrowed her eyes. What's your mamma's name? Mamma? Your grandmama, what's her name? Monty? Hmm, unusual name. It's a nickname, I don't know, means Montana, where she was born. Montana. Hmm, don't know her Christian name? Yes, I do. And why? Well, of course, I want to add her to the prayer chain at church. Lila Piercy. And how you spell that? Ella spelled it out as Lou copied it onto a pad. She saved. Sorry? I'll take that as a no. Catholic, as far as I know. Why? Catholic. Hmm. You Catholic, too? Lou, I can't do this right now. Of course, but maybe when you return, you'll join us downtown. We have a very nice Sunday brunch and some very nice men in the singles club, now that you and Mr. Riley. Geez, does everybody know? Yes, sugar, everybody knows, and you're not the first nor the last notch on his bud post. She smiled. Bless your heart. Nothing broken. Just a few feathers ruffled, I trust. Ella tried to shrug off the hot flush of shame. You do know he's engaged to. I am not going to Minnesota, Ella interrupted and stood up to leave. Ms. Donovan, sit down. Ella sat. Whatever inspired you to bold face lie to me about your mamma is really none of my concern, but lie you did, and that tells me there's a lot of unfinished business back home. I've seen this time and time again, and I don't want you crying in my office in six months and needing time off or a bed in rehab or threatening suicide because you didn't deal with your mamma. Go, say good bit, goodbye, forgive and you'll be forgiven in Jesus Christ's name. Now sign this and get out of here. Ella signed the form, her hand shaking. And one more thing. What's that? Mr. Michael James Mahoney is not available as a notch on your bedpost. Ella looked at her incredulously. That's all, Miss Donovan. Ella floated across campus, fuming inside. Lou was making it impossible for her to succeed at her new job. Is that what she wanted all along? As she passed by the Genesis exercise yard, a client in his bright blue jumpsuit bounced and pitched a basketball into the hoop. It was Algernon. She stopped to watch, wondering if her leaving might instigate him to go AWOL again. He saw her and walked up to the fence. Yo, Buffy, what's up? Out trying to save the world? Sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you. Unfortunately, we'll miss our sessions this week. Where are you going? It's my grandmother. She's dying. I'm going home to say goodbye. A wave of unwanted emotion washed over her. Whatever. Just do me a favor, please, Algernon. Maybe. Promise me you'll be here when I get back. Well, if you're going to turn on the waterworks. What do you mean? I'm not a crier. Uh-huh, and you're not sad. Your eyes are just leaking. I I'm not. She brushed the wet from her cheeks. Yeah, uh-huh. Begs the question, though, doesn't it? Why am I on this side of the fence when you need to get fixed worse than me? See you when I get back. Ain't going nowhere. Be careful up there around all them white people. He ran to a far corner of the court, aimed and shot the ball towards the hoop. It dropped through effortlessly. I feel like a lot of my creative energy is going toward anger at the people who should be serving the world responsibly and aren't. I'm having to really force myself to stop listening every once in a while or stop learning about what's being done to people and to the earth in order to, um, to let my creativity come out. So it's hard. I, I think people who have been creative in their lives have a need, an urgent need, a, 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 um, a, a compulsion to continue to be creative, but we've got to find ways to do it in a way that helps the community around us, um, that incorporates some of the injustices that are being done. That's what I'm having trouble with. A week after he left me, I went to my gym. The gym had been our place. We liked working out together, comparing rep schemes and complaining afterwards about almost dying. People knew us as a CrossFit couple. 
It was a hard workout that day, but nothing I hadn't suffered through before. I did okay the first round of exercises. The second round, I scaled back. In the middle of the third round, as I was running 200 meters, I felt the water start to push its way out of my eyeballs. They all know, I thought. Everyone here knows he left me. They're wondering what I did to make him go. I stifled a sob. Back in my exercise spot, I tried to resume doing medicine ball slams, but I couldn't. Stifling sobs makes it hard to breathe. So I gave up. I threw my towel into my workout bag and started gathering my stuff. The coach came over to see what I was doing, and I didn't pretend. I rambled some tremulous paranoia in a shaky voice about everyone judging me, like anyone cared about anything at that moment other than doing burpees in 95 degrees. But it didn't matter. I was insane with grief and fear, and I couldn't stop my voice from shaking, and I needed to get out of there, away from the place we had known and loved together, the place where everyone thought he loved me. I wasn't really insane. I was alive and kind of functioning. But trauma changes the brain. There are worse things happening every hour of every day than a woman losing a man, but it was a seismic shift in my world. I felt off kilter, like I was missing a limb. Can grief make my whole body hurt? I asked the therapist. Yes, she said, of course. Grief does whatever the fuck it wants. As I drove home, I cried and I thought about what to do. I mean, in some ways, I just had to do what was right in front of me. Stop at the grocery, cook for the kids, grade papers, do laundry. I only had to keep moving and checking stuff off the list. Clean the kitchen, feed the dogs, teach college students, clean the kitchen again, work out, eat right, sleep. It was easy stuff to do, unless you can't stop crying. I wanted to crawl into my bed and fall asleep in the fetal position for the next three weeks or so. I wanted to lay in bed and watch the new facts of my life float above me like ticker tape until I could put it all in order and make sense of it. I deserved to do that. I was suffering and in pain. My whole being needed rest and healing, but nobody had explained that to the universe or to my children. I was a wounded soldier forced to continue marching across the battlefield. The situation seemed impossible. But futility somehow brought me to the edge of opportunity. I had options. I could maybe start doing drugs. I could lose 10 pounds. I could gain 10 pounds. I could buy something expensive and set it on fire. The children and I could move to the Bahamas and I could fish for a living. Instead, that afternoon, driving home crying, I unexpectedly birthed a woman. It was unplanned. She just pushed herself right out of my brain and into my aura. She was tall and Amazonian with auburn hair, like mine, interwoven with reedy branches. She was a warrior girl who could make spears out of tree limbs and coax life from dirt with a steely gaze. She could kill things that needed killing, or maybe just hurt them with her spear. She slipped herself over my shoulders and I zipped her up over me like a jumpsuit and stopped crying. A calm descended. As I drove the rest of the way home, the radio was on, but my ears were buzzing because I kind of wasn't in charge anymore. Later in the evening, after the household was quiet, I got on the Google webs and started researching. I wanted her to have a name, a strong name, a kick-ass name. She was part me, after all. Bellatrix. I finally settled on Bellatrix, a Latin word for female warrior. Bellatrix wild because she comes from nature and showers in the rain and can nap in a tree. At first I put an E on the end of wild, but it seemed pretentious. I didn't remember at the time about Bellatrix Strange and Harry Potter and how she was in love with Lord Voldemort, but the fact that she's a witch did not deter me. I'll be honest, I mean, this whole thing seems a little supernatural. Bellatrix Wild has one sole mission, which is to help me live my life right now. She gives no fucks. Sometimes I feel sorry for myself and wonder if I'll ever feel happy again. Bellatrix Wild tucks me under an imaginary super soft comforter and kisses me on the forehead and goes to work. Bellatrix takes charge. She cleans like a motherfucker and can do burpees like an animal. And when she gets tired of doing burpees, she doesn't cry. She just says, I'm done doing these goddamn burpees and I give no fucks about what anybody thinks about it. Bellatrix Wild doesn't cry. I still cry. This whole ordeal has ignited in me old flames of anger aimed at people, and if I see one of those people in the grocery store, I want to cry. But if that happens, I pull on the Bellatrix jumpsuit and I sip it up, and Bellatrix gives evil, fake smiles to those people and throws imaginary unripe avocados at their heads. You know, I've heard of this, said the therapist. I just went to a conference where they talked about people using dissociative personalities to deal with trauma. Really, I asked? So I'm, like, turning into Sybil? No, she said thoughtfully after a discomforting moment or two. No, in your case, I think you can make it work. Me and Bellatrix felt our hearts leap a little. 
As the, weeks tick, as the weeks tick by, my need for Bellatrix has been less urgent. I'm stronger. I planted beans and peas in my garden a few weeks ago, and between the blazing sun and afternoon monsoons, the vines have burst forth in a startling, fruitful, chaotic intertwining of greens and blooms and beans. The other day I was in the dirt pulling weeds, and I imagined my little bountiful plot as a place Bellatrix could live, where she could thrive and be nourished and become part of the earth she loves. It occurred to me that maybe Bellatrix isn't really part me. Maybe I'm part Bellatrix and finally finding space to grow. It's possible. I'm looking forward to election day. I hope everyone else is and I hope everyone else votes. It's been difficult to see the constant, relentless, unassuaged violence against people who have a body like mine. Chapter one, Mardi Gras, 12 weeks. This is the type of shit I hate, Gray says, walking through the open French doors into the Bourbon Street Hotel. And what's that? Joy asks, dancing a two-step behind her into the cool interior. All of this. Gray waves her hand at the revelry. The tourists, this ingratiating show for people who don't even get it. Gray, it's Mardi Gras, Joy rolls her eyes. All of this is for tourists. What's there to get? It's a party. Yeah, it's a party that never stops. That's what everybody thinks anyway. What else are they supposed to think? Nothing, since they don't live here. It's just that this is a lie. Huh? Don't worry about it. Gray lags behind, letting Joy lead the way toward the bank of elevators that will take them to her floor. Joy dances the entire way. Her body twists and shakes into the, her body twists and shakes in time to the multitude of brass bands passing the hotel door, celebrating the PG debauchery of Fat Tuesday in the daytime. Gray watches her friend watching herself in the reflective metal of the elevator doors. Her hands shake rhythms into the wrinkles of her long Indian curls that were bagged into bundles and then sewn into the wig on her head. Her unrestrained A cups test the seams of her yellow tank top. Her booty bounces up and down and then sways into a rhythmic shake. Joy is the personification of carefree. Her light twerk denotes adulting in the daytime, belying the secrets yet to come when the sun goes down and her husband returns to their room. The elevator dings mid-shake. Joy continues her shimmy, moving the rhythm from her ass to her shoulders. She steps onto the elevator, inviting the guests getting off to dance with her. An older, beet red and burned couple sidle up next to her toasted peanut butter arms and join her shimmy for a beat before they head into the chaos of the Mardi Gras parades. Gray, what's wrong? Joy asks half-heartedly once the elevator doors close. Her bounce continues in the elevator, thanks to the music piped in from the street. Nothing, Gray answers, wrapping her arms across her belly. I know what it is, Joy says, booty dancing in front of Gray. You're mad you can't drink. Oh, really? Yeah, no one told you to get pregnant before carnival in the first place. Afterwards, sure, but before? Who does that? You know you want a daiquiri. You have all the answers, don't you? Gray says. Stepping off the elevator onto the third floor. Of course I do. Joy walks a plush carpeted hall to her hotel door, throwing her words behind her. I mean, you can't be mad at the tourists for enjoying the delectable offerings of the Big Easy. That would mean you're mad at me. I'm a tourist and I'm your best friend, which means you can't possibly be mad at me. That's against the bestie code. What are we, 12? Joy ignores Gray and slips the room key out of the tight fitted back pocket of her cut off denim shorts and inserts it into the door. The lock clicks and she, sashay the lock clicks and she sashays into the room, letting her hips emphasize the long and short notes of the trumpets, trombones and drums rocking the room, rocking the room walls from outside. The music moves Joy through the door, past the king size bed, to the French doors leading to the balcony. Music blares from the street below. The plumage from colorful floats pass, proudly carrying crews along the route of the 24-hour party. 
I have to pee, Gray yells to Joy on the balcony. Okay, Joy yells behind her. Hey, mister, throw me some beads. A thick rope of colorful beads clatter on the wrought iron balcony railing. The clinking sound is muted by the resounding hush of the closed bathroom door. Gray unbuttons her jeans and eases them over her thighs. The rough hewn fabric stutters before following her finger's guidance to slouch around her ankles. She sits on the white hotel commode, looking at her almost flat belly. She exhales the bottle of water she drank earlier and that whizzes into the pipe. She sits and drips dry, trying and failing to forget the uncomfortable truth. She is pregnant, 12 weeks pregnant, with what she knows is not her first baby. All of us are having to cope with the same thing. Uh, and, and so uh, it's, I think it, in, in its own way, it's bringing us together. You know, it, it has its way of, of being divisive as well, but uh, maybe the overall effect is a positive one, I'm hoping. This morning, more than 12 years after that bus ride to Minto, I returned to Patna on a one-day business visit. Wouldn't inlay work on decorative items, a Bihari specialty. Once the order was finalized, I felt like seeing Minto again, ready to rethink the Mintoan enigma, an older and better judge of human nature. Something in me has always said that if I could understand them, I could understand myself. If I could understand them, I could understand our country in all its callow bombast and hoary wisdom. If I could understand them, I could understand the world. So, picking up the newspaper lying on my hotel room table, I went out and caught a rickshaw. No buses for me this time. The rickshawala said he'd have to take a roundabout route to Patna College. A procession was crowding the regular route. I said that was okay, and we started off. This procession is for what reason? I asked the pedaling rickshawala in Hindi. Many people are dying from sickness, he said, turning his head slightly. Everybody's scared, and the government is not doing anything. That is why this procession has been brought out. Unfolding the Patna edition of the Times, I looked over the headlines. The first one on the left said, City panic-stricken as mystery disease claims 60. The article informed me that Patna is threatened by what's thought to be Japanese encephalitis, but might also be meningitis or brain fever. The rickshaw rolled past an avenue of large teak trees flapping elfin ear leaves, and I saw that Gandhi Maidan was unchanged, Gandhiji still leaning tiredly the park trellis lying aimlessly around the base, but more of them this time, I thought, liquor bottles openly by their sides. I couldn't spot the pink pussycat anywhere. When I asked the rickshawala about it, he said there was no such restaurant, though he thought he'd heard the name once. Just as well. Only me this time. No good-natured joker for company. Long while since I'd seen Feroz, let alone the jovial side of him. We had too many arguments, following first the Ayodhya mosque versus temple controversy, then the mosque's destruction by Hindu extremists, and finally the Bombay riots and bombings. Over such cataclysmic events, even the closest of friends take sides, feel betrayed, grow distant. I read on. The article's writer blamed the mysterious outbreak on unhygienic street conditions. Hundreds of pigs lived quite happily on the streetside garbage and sewage in normal times. But now, many a porker had been found dead. The pigs were suspected to be carriers. Mistakenly, it seemed to me, since encephalitis is spread by mosquitoes. And they were being rounded up and taken to a pig camp on the outskirts of the city. 
shouts and threats had flared up between localists, uh, between localities vying for municipal sweepers. Inevitably, fisticuffs broke out between the factions. One fellow grew so wild, he pulled out a pistol and shot another man in the face. A voice screamed in the street and I pulled my head quickly out of the paper. The shrieks were loud and angry, yet deeply afraid. They had a strange tonal quality, but I knew why as soon as I saw where they came from. A huge black bristled hog was being roped onto a pole, screeching his lungs out through a tied down snout. I walked down the slope and turned onto the path leading back to Minto. And there it was, as solemn and brick red as before, but larger than I'd remembered, as if it had grown in the intervening years, pushed outward. Peering through the tall verticals of an iron gate into the courtyard, I saw that the wash stalls on the other hand had vanished, leaving a bare patch on the grass. Beyond the open rectangle, the hostel's corridors were mostly still, only once a student rounding the stairs. He looked small and unimpressive, distant against my still vivid mental imprint of the student precedent and the man called Mahesh. But when he turned to look outside, all the distance couldn't hide his quick frown as he caught sight of the lone silent observer at the gate. I shook my head at the brusque inquiring hand gesture from him and to reassure him turned slowly away. Even so, he strode into the courtyard, kicking at a yelping pie dog, its coat splotched like the skin of an overripe banana, and out to the gate. When the man, a sturdy young, slick-haired fellow, with a curl to his upper lip, reached the gate and opened it, I stayed outside, but told him of my college day's visit to Minto. What had happened to the wash stalls, I asked, and he laughed unpleasantly. Why, he said, did I want to go to the toilet? His expression was coarse and leering. I asked about the Mintone's MD routine and learned it was still practiced. Once more, across the span of a dozen years, I was invited to attend. I felt tempted to watch from a distance, but decided even that might be undignified for a married man in his 30s. Just as I thought to inquire about the price of bus tickets for students these days, I felt a dull sting on my arm and slapped at it. A mosquito droned away in a contemptuous spiral, and my heart began to thud as though I had run full speed up the cart. The modern day Minturn reached out and clapped his hands hard. When he opened them, I saw the small splash of red and black. He sneered at my expression and flicked the insect away, wiped his palms on his pants. I stood there talking to him, ignoring the sting, until I'd pushed back thoughts of mysterious plagues. Then I said goodbye and caught a rickshaw to my hotel. I have the urge now, alone in my room, to scratch the mosquito bite. To whom it may concern Are the trees still tall Thick green and white Do they brush the sky 
Are the oceans still blue? Do the whales sing to you? I'd like to know. I'd like to know what happens in the end when we're old and dead. What happens in the end? Is the earth dead? I'd like to know. I'd like to know. What happens in the end? Won't you ride back? Are the trees still tall, thick green and white? Are the oceans still blue? Do the whales sing to you? Are they wild and free, like we want to be? I'd like to know I'd like to know Won't you ride back Won't you ride back in time Oh, hi. Jacks by Jacks wouldn't be Jacks by Jacks without the student showcase. And while time constraints caused us to limit the quantity of students reading this year, it certainly didn't limit the quality. Sue Erta Container of the Bowles School will kick things off, followed by Trinity Jones and Summer Carrier from Douglas Anderson School of the Arts. Sean McCurdy and a mysterious Mr. Do-Good from FSCJ will read after that. Our final student reader will be Hannah Glaser from UNF. We appreciate the hard work these students and their teachers have put into preparing for these performances, and we're grateful to the schools for continuing to send us such great talent. A couple of those students are pretty tall. Maybe I could get them to help me down, or maybe haul over some books from Chamlin's to build some steps. Y'all go on ahead. I'll figure it out. Stage one, denial. Good morning, my son. Morning seems to crown you king with its rays of light. Liquid jewels are surmounted on your forehead, and I know you had a bad dream. Morning does not bring justice to night terrors, nor does it bring justice to loss. Your bedsheets have been left in an array, knotted, tangled waves of gray that you have slept in. I know before I have entered the room, you will fix them, won't you, darling? Stage two, anger. Playing God is rewarded by the devil himself, and hell is meant for thieves. I commend you for your thievery, because your robbery stole more than can be supplanted by the justice of imprisonment. You think you are stealing from a history museum? That history can be removed with the removal of its makers? My son was not a worthless replica of life. Skin of plastic and glazed polish, no, his chestnut skin was the world and everything in it. 
My son received his divinity from ochre roots. Arms stretched towards skies of brown soil. You and your mothers and fathers and sons and daughters used to dig their fingernails deep between the same gods of brown and chestnut that our mothers and sons and daughters did, playing with divinity a game that she let you play. Prayers of dirt dug deep into skin of a generation of equality because God was a white man and the devil was supposed to be his opposite. So where were our fathers when your children were playing in our soil? Ask the blood on your hands. Stage three, bargaining. If only I had called February 23rd. You would have left the house five minutes later and your legs would have been used for jogging and walking and sprinting, but not trembling. If only you had turned right instead of left after leaving your house. Left was an unlucky direction, I told you, I told you, son. And when padded shoes hit asphalt, you should have known that you would be running on a timer instead of running on time. Had we been fruitful enough to buy time and new shoes, maybe you wouldn't have to run on damned sidewalks. If only hate and discrimination were words found in history books instead of men's hearts and black or white were unspoken words and steering prejudice's decision of which man was hunted and which was the hunter just like your hunter steered their car over to your side of the street. Left. I know it was left. If only you had taken the time to make your bed. Stage four, depression. I sleep in your sheets. They are my own coffin. As if one death was not enough for eager criminals. The sheets whisper to me the name of the soil which you rest in, and I feel as if I am by your side. We are united on earth or in heaven. I, I do not know. Either you are alive or I have died. How long ago was it that you were buried? Stage five, acceptance. Acceptance is never compensation for bereavement and mourning never brought justice to my night terror. Rest in power. When I heard he passed, I was worried he left without knowing the impact he had on all of us. I was worried he never had the chance to witness our sea of black fists raising in his honor, never had the chance to see the spectrum of children trampling innocent Walmart buyers for the last Black Panther costume that probably didn't fit them, that he never saw the change he, he had on the face of the black community because Negro is now the hero, not the dope dealer. Negro resides in mansions, not lurking in bandos. Negro is T'Challa's platinum necklace, not the state's ankle monitor. Negro is not a thug, not a savage, but royalty. We are royalty. Chadwick is royalty. I was worried until I remembered the exasperation on his face when we made him do the Wakanda salute every day. What was a fad to him is our symbol of black excellence and black beauty. And I knew he didn't leave this world unknowing of our love, admiration, and appreciation. I knew he didn't leave us. His leadership was just needed in a world beyond our own. Strange snow. I prayed for its resurrection into eternal life as I walked barefoot through a wooded area, the balls of my feet crunching against a strange snow, tarping the floor soft and coarse. The air was thick and gray and polluted with exhaust. I inhaled its heavy perfume, new particles weighing inside of my lungs as I coughed the old ones out again and again. I looked at the red sky and saw the silhouette of a single bird circling the wood in search of a home beneath the rubble, overwhelmed by the sudden destitution of this once scenic nature. Then placed a gentle hand on a tree close to me, trying to find a pulse beneath its scorched flesh, desperate to not be the only living thing here. And I shuddered at the chalk marks on my palm left by the charred wood as the crumbled pieces fell to my feet like fine sand, a piece of myself crumbling with it, becoming one with the debris of burned leaves, brown bark turned to black, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, 
dust to dust. Privilege of ignorance. Another day, I wake up to the sound of the muffled voice and my panting dog, <laughs> my sweet golden retriever. He's rowdy this morning, wide eyes and bushy tail whisking carpet as he follows me to the kitchen. But even expecting it, I am bombarded by the radio waves that were left on all night. Her voice, familiar, like the slightly smudged countertops, the dirty sneakers by the front door, the radio, black, glowing orange under the same 89.9, illuminates the dusty table, the crowded shelves. She says, it's suicide again. Her voice, the same, unwelcome in my home, ever the uninvited guest, reluctant neighbor to my unwavering disappointment in my ability to come to terms, to just press the power button until I do. And it's over. And the radio is off. Now, in the spirit of familiar things, it's time to make breakfast and feed my dog. My dog, rolling onto his back, unaware. My dog, his paws open, belly waiting for my hand, my loyal golden, who doesn't even know what suicide is. Okay. Drawing a map home on a downhill curve. Down a twisting driveway we have not ever fixed. My house lies, past the park, past the Publix, and past the church we never went to. My house can't grow two new feet. It is caught by the river where the oyster shells are left behind, jagged, ripped, cracked open, consumed, and left to catch my toes. But still, my house is growing. Plants, <laughs> trees that crowd the gutters, work my bones, and summer squash, green tomatoes, herbs, mint and parsley. My house has a roof full of dead bark for bird's nests and solar panels. These machines that power the pool by the porch half dug up because the boards were bending out of place and we still haven't finished fixing it yet. Now that she has everyone's attention. So do you still believe you are not a part of this biological system that governs all life on this planet? Or are you still oblivious to the real danger you or a loved one could be in? The Greeks called her Gaia, the goddess of the earth. Today we just to refer to her as Earth with no special connotation or consideration, and she is not treated like a goddess by any means. Quite honestly, she is being treated much like we treat ourselves, exploited and used. Exploited by Homo sapiens and used in a system of wealth that defies our biology, and in, re in turn exploits that as well. There is no true balance in our made-up, fictitious system of exploitation, but we have pushed biological balance out of whack, and Gaia is responding in kind. You do not need to think of her as a living, breathing entity with a singular consciousness, although it could be argued that evolution is a kind of neural network in disguise. But at the bare minimum, recognize that this planet is a biological system that we are a part of, and our actions have reactions in more ways than we can fully understand some for the good and some for the bad. Now that she has everyone's attention, put your phones and devices down and go spend time with her outside. And for once in your life, listen. And as you listen, take a deep breath of air, air that does not have millions of cars, trains, planes, and factories pumping tons of pollution into it. Air that is almost breathable for an entire planet. Air that has millions upon millions of birds that can sing without being choked by our byproducts. 
Oxygen fresh from a tree, plant, or shrub. Nature's air fresheners. All that hippy-dippy save the world stuff is real, and these are the consequences of not playing by the rules. Laziness and ignorance can no longer be an excuse to not make the changes that have to be made. The economy is not an excuse to kill hundreds of millions of creatures, including how we treat our fellow sapiens. Maybe the sight of people we know dying from our collective ignorance can help fuel the winds of change. We think we can control everything, but all Gaia did was hiccup and our whole system shuts down. Maybe we should take this time to reevaluate our position on this planet and how we interact with it. Trent Reznor sang, we will all be judged by what we leave behind, but will it matter if there is no one left to see it? The Reclamation of Our Republic from the Letters of Mr. Duguid. Brothers and sisters, listen to the lies they tell us as they always have. I dare you to call yourself a patriot and stop doing the dance of puppets that American life has become. We must cut our strings and once again declare ourselves free from elitist tyrannies given modern form. Mrs. Duguid herself called this a republic on the birthday of the Constitution in 1788. So why have we repeated the mistakes of our fathers by allowing corporations and other depraved parties to rule our lives and shape our destiny? Why do we submit under the yolk of the rotten egg the parties have become? How could we let the cancer of hypocrisy go untreated for so long? I'll tell you why. It is because the faithful of the American dream have become the faithless. As opposed to living and being better than the worst around us, we instead choose to sully the names of the great Americans of the past. Men like Abraham Lincoln, Bass Reeves, and John Adams proved themselves better than the America they were born into and sought to bring the true America forward. Women like Emma Lazarus, Harriet Tubman, and Susan Anthony would marvel at how far we've come, while still looking forward to where we need to go. This nation's software is out of date and full of viruses, and it needs the people to take it back and update it against these modern threats. So, like Lady Liberty, will you break your shackles and claim yourself to be free of these tyrannies, or will you wallow in your own muck of self-pity and claim you have no power to do anything about it? I myself will not sit idly by while my home, destiny, and free will itself are ripped out from under me. True Americans do not submit to anything they know to be wrong. Just as we all know this so-called democracy is the outdated tool of the elites, so too do we know what must be done with it. We must pull them out of our veritable Garden of Eden, root and stem, and throw them aside like the weeds they are. We shall make this garden very wildly in its beauty, and all shall be watered and shown the sun. We act towards the common goal of humanity first, and the true manifest destiny of these United States, to bring forth life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and from it stay forth the reclamation of the Republic. Just like the movies. Sometimes I think I'm cursed. Not like the whiny, why is it always me kind of cursed. More like, huh, this seems to happen a lot kind of way. In my case, this being almost dying. Like an unseen force that wants me to stop breathing. My roommate Sarah jokes that God loves to challenge us. Well, he's been challenging me for the last 20 years. Let's start with the most recent event, the crash. You know how in movies, when something intense happens, the sound shuts off, it's still, and the world floats? Before, I thought it was a load of nonsense, an excuse by the cinematic team to cut the violence without the grotesque noise of it all. Now I know exactly how silent it was. The silence that followed my head cracking into the airbags. The silence as I made sure my roommate was alive. The silence when I saw the second car coming, followed by the deafening crash as my side of the car was careened into once more. That had been the second time I looked through a window and felt the imminence of my death. Coming home should have been the same as always. Lock the doors, drop my book bag, let the dogs out fix myself a snack, and get started on my homework. I had just completed four of those tasks. My routine was shattered while ma taking 
microwaved egg rolls to the living room. I saw a man staring back at me through the front window. He stood at least a foot taller than me. His hoodie's bulk only added to his massive figure. The light from the outside poured around him into my dark home, silhouetting the shadow of his frame. He lowered the hand holding a phone to his pocket, later realizing he had been taking photos of my home. Memories of an 18-year-old who had been shot on my street when I was a child resurfaced. Now it is my turn to be found dead in this empty house. My chest concaved and pushed out a screech. Hey! After the car spiraled, we bounced once more into the road. I looked at Sarah. Smoke floated around her. Get out, I screamed. It's going to catch fire. My hands fumbled for the buckle. Outside, a boy who had seen our crash waited. He helped me stand. He couldn't have been older than 16. I was breathing heavy through my mouth. My nose felt broken. Air couldn't pass through what I assumed were nostrils of blood. I looked back. There the car stood. Black hood crumpled, headlights shattered, windows somehow intact. I realized two things. The car had not yet caught fire, and both our phones and registration information were still inside. The sounds of my screams resonated in the room around me. Even through the window, I could feel the intensity of his stare. No eyes were visible under the hood, but the way his posture tensed indicated he could see me in the shadows. I was a butterfly pinned under the glass. He'd already broken the patio lock. I was certain he'd get inside the house. The man then did the one thing I hadn't seen coming. He turned on his heel and bolted back outside. As he ran, so did I pitching for the window to look for where he was going. He made it into his gold van, took a large sip of his big gulp, and gunned it down my street. Too many cars were parked on the road for me to catch a license plate. They saw he was out of sight, my knees buckled and hit the floor. Looking down at my hands, it registered the plate of egg rolls remained in my grip, surprisingly intact. I set it down with a light click. I thought about what would have happened if he'd come inside and began to sob. My dogs began to bark in the backyard. As I look around at the surrounding miles of trees and the beginning lines of backed up cars, my only choice became clear. I, in a mo in moment of low impulse control, ran into the smoldering vehicle. Sarah screamed, Hannah, what the fuck are you doing? We need to call the police and my parents. I scrambled onto the floor of the car until I found the phones and pulled the papers from the glove box. As I ran back to Sarah, a glass crunched beneath my feet. Sarah was talking to the boy who had helped me. Two of his friends had joined them as well. Sarah was asking for shoes. I looked down and saw in the sea of glass she was barefoot. Making my next bad decision of the day, I ran back into the car to get her shoes. Sarah screamed at me again as the boys joined me and helped get the luggage from the back while I searched for shoes. In my home, I stood up and brought myself back through the kitchen to let the dogs in. The desire to have a safe voice beyond my own consumed me. I walked once more to the kitchen, grabbed my discarded phone, and called my dad. Dad hiccuped into the receiver. Someone tried to break in. He was watching me through the window. Oh Christ, Hannah, did you call the police? Is your brother home? No, Dad, I'm alone. I'm on my way now. Call the police right now. I handed Sarah her shoes. A woman who really loves Jesus pulled up to us and hugged me and said everything happens for a reason. Why do people say that? Someone could shoot me in the leg for a reason, but that doesn't make my leg less shot. But I said thank you and let her feel comfort in her own words. gonna shine my back door someday and I'm going down to the river gonna take my rocking 
train. If this big bad blues don't quit me, rock away from them. Trouble in my mind, I'm blue. My poor heart's beating slow. I seen so much trouble before. Satisfy my mind. My good man, don't quit me. I've almost lost my mind. And if you see me laughing, laughing just to keep from crying. Trouble in my mind, who oh, I'm blue. I won't be blue. Oh, Sun's gonna shine my back door someday. Satisfied 